Photographs record the world in a way, and of course we can manipulate them, but you know, if you want them to be, they can be very accurate and real. I think that an accurate, real sort of like approach to making images right now is, uh, is you know, in order. It could be something that would just be, I mean, I think it's what everybody should do. Hello and welcome to Art Goes On, a podcast featuring art people on how they keep the art world running. Here they will share their vision of the present and a glimpse of the future. I'm your host, Pierre de Montesquieu, recording from Paris, France, so please pardon my English. Before we start, as we try to make this show interactive, here's a quick reminder to follow our Instagram account at AskArtGoesOn, where you'll be able to ask questions to upcoming guests. Now, on to today's show. I have the pleasure to receive Todd Heido, an American photographer who doesn't need introduction. But in short, he photographs like a documentarian and prints like a painter. Hi, Todd. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you for being with us. So, Todd, how art is going for you? It's going, and it's, um, it's interesting how, um, well, production of art is going very well, and um, um, it's kind of, it's curious how um, being a photographer, you have these, like, like, there's always this sort of, like, ebb and flow to your process and, and your production, because, you know, part of your work is to go out into the world and, and take pictures and bring things back to your studio, and, and you, you sort through them and sift through them, and you find like what the threads are um, in the world, in your world, you know, by kind of looking at what you've made and what you've responded to. And so that, that part of the process has been something that um, I actually be, have been doing a lot of before all this lockdown happened. And then um, one of the things that ends up happening with me is sometimes I feel like I spend a lot of time out in the world looking and finding things. And then, but this is kind of turned upside down. So like, I have, I've been home for basically 75 days. And um, ironically, the last place I was was Deauville, France. I was working on a commission by the, from the city there for a festival they're having. I'll pronounce it wrong because I don't speak French. I'm, I'm sorry. But it, it's called a, a Planches Contact. It's, I think, a, a biennial. Uh, no, every year there's a, um, a, a photography exhibition in Deauville. And so I was leaving uh, on, the, on the motorway there, um, you know, and I saw the signs. I was going to De Gaulle, you know, um, and it said, you know, tune into 107.7 for COVID-19 info. And that was on, on February 28th. And I'd been there for a couple of weeks uh, shooting for this commission, and it was wonderful. And, and I really have to say one thing about, like, I, I really am so excited and lucky that the French people have, there's something about my work that they respond to, and I, I feel very lucky for that. Um, and, and I respond to many things French as well. Um, but it was just, as a last experience photographing, it was a really good one because it was, I was with, you know, the, the, the director of the festival, you know, and, and other artists that were from uh, like different parts of the country and they were there doing their work. And we were all sort of like, it was kind of like, as close as uh, I've been in a while to like a, an artist residency, we all stayed in the same house and we all would go out each day and photograph and like, you know, we would eat dinner together if we could. And it was just a really super positive experience for me to have as my last out in the world uh, um, time of photographing. So that was, so that was sort of what I was doing um, up until this lockdown happened. As soon as I got home, Things started to close up, and and we all know what happens next. But it's it's curious as a um, as an artist, you know, like, like I mentioned, like as a photographer, like out in the world, you know, time is about a third of your time, and then two thirds of the time is really sort of in your studio, you know, editing and sequencing and picking images, and then and then working on your printing, and that's sort of what I've done in the last seventy five days as I've been. Uh, uh, sorting through images for shows that I have coming up and then working on sorting my images from this, uh, uh, the commission in Duville. And I just been really like extra focused on that because it's been um, something that's um, uh, was really fresh. And so I'm, I'm happy for being able to like uh, spend my time focusing in on that kind of stuff. When you were in Deauville, there was already the threat of a lockdown. Yeah. Was it a topic you discussed with the other artists of the festival? 
You know, I, I, I don't think any of us, I remember the last night I was there and I remember there was a young man from Milan, but he had been in France for a while. And of course, when you're on an artist residency and you're in your 20s, you don't really spend all your time looking at the news, but that's something I actually, I, 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 I'm not 20 and, uh, and I look at the news all the time. And um, I feel like none of us really understood exactly what was coming. I actually let him know that like, oh, they closed Italy. And he was like, what? And it was um, a surprise, you know, I mean, it just occurred, you know. Anyhow, it was sort of like, a, I don't think we understood what was coming. Um, and I don't think anybody, like when this whole thing started, I remember in the beginning, like, oh, this is a great time. I'm going to get all these different things done. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to organize everything. I'm going to get all these projects done that I've been wanting to do, but I'm always traveling so I can't, you know, that, that sort of lasts for about two or three weeks. You know, your, your, your spirit for like, I'm going to learn how to like, you know, people say like bake bread, you know, like, uh, but I mean, I, I, that's a metaphor for me is, um, so I think that we didn't really know what was coming. So we didn't really have a discussion about it. I do know that it's, it's, it's good to be able to have the, the shooting experience behind us. And I think, and we're all, we're, we're all producing work for this exhibition that will hopefully occur in October and in, in Duville. But other than that, you know, we were just sort of off doing our own thing, as photographers do. Then the lockdown occurred. As you are doing a lot of workshops, you're a lot in contact with artists and photographers. Have you heard anything from them? Like everybody else, all the things that were planned were canceled. Like um, I was actually supposed to go to Italy to photograph um, and be involved in a festival there. And then that was canceled. That was the first thing canceled. I actually was the one that canceled that because I was like, I'm not going to go to Italy because I might be stuck in Italy. Because um, I unfortunately know a man that's been in China since January. Um, and he's been stuck there. He finally made it through to Hong Kong, but he lives in San Francisco and uh, he hasn't been home since January. And so I, I was aware of like, uh, I, we kind of were following him and, I was aware of like what could be coming because whatever was happening there was going to probably happen elsewhere. So anyway, the Italian trip was canceled. And then, and then as soon as I got back, you know, there was a workshop I was supposed to do in um, Montana in um, Chico hot springs, um, which was a really exciting thing for the charcoal book club. And there were some really amazing photographers coming in. We were like one of those things where you look forward to like doing it because like your colleagues are there and there, and there's like seven different people that are, that you're excited about being around in addition to all the students that would be there. Um, and that was canceled. And then Palm Springs workshop was canceled and then photo London was canceled and so on and so on. And um, we'll see what happens in the fall. And like I'd been discussing earlier, you know, I really hope that people just sort of try to be patient and just sort of be careful and understand that, um, you know, science is um, what leads this and our behavior is what protects us. And those are the two facts that we know. You're, of course, doing interiors and portrait photos, but most people know you through your landscapes photographs. Did you have the opportunity to go out and take photos despite the lockdown? I've taken a few photos. I've taken pictures of landscapes because uh, very early on, I realized that like your um, car is a space shuttle and you can kind of take this little space shuttle out into the world. And for me, conveniently, many of the landscape pictures I take, I actually am in the car anyway. And so that was a really easy uh, transition. And I've, I've done, I've gone out a few times to photograph, but I'm not super interested in like the, like the, the empty streets of San Francisco because actually a lot of times when I photograph them, or the suburbs, I find that isolation anyhow, especially when working at night, you know, there, there are images that are like, you know, they look just exactly the same now, as opposed to um, whether they're locked down or not, maybe there's just more people home. And curiously, like, um, I actually, what, like, when I take photographs of the houses at night, I just do it. I don't ask permission. I just sort of photograph and I'm very obvious and I'm, I'm out in the open. I'm not like hiding or anything or sneaking. I just sort of like, I'm on the sidewalk just taking pictures and that works just fine most of the time. And then, but now I feel like there's this really heightened sense of, of awareness of, what, of what's going on in your neighborhood, who's outside. It's such a strange thing. The thing that I've been really blown away by is that it's just the level of noise that is gone. I live in like, like 
sort of like the Oakland Berkeley Hills um, in the lower part. And um, there's always noise on the freeway that, you know, the, the freeway is like, you know, two miles away, but you can still hear it. It's totally silent at night. There's no airplanes at all that were going over for a while. There was a while where like I could l lean out my window and it was just absolutely silent. And uh, that was such a strange, strange thing. Um, I knew that everybody was home, but everybody was sleeping. And it's it just, um, it's curious how um, people have probably caught up on their sleep, hopefully. But anyway, so, so I haven't been out a lot photographing. The, the times I have is, um, it's hard to tell the difference at this moment. Um, but I will say one thing I've been thinking about is I've been thinking a lot about Dorothea Lang. And I've been thinking about Walker Evans and the Farm Security Administration photographers. Um, and I really feel like there's, there should be some kind of a push or some collective or some umbrella that is able to sort of photograph what's coming because like, the visual aspect of what's happened is coming in a couple of months. You know what I mean? Because I don't know about in, in France, but in America, things are, the unrest is starting very much so. And we're very, very divided for sure. And um, which is really, really unfortunate. And it makes all of this so much harder. And then, you know, the, like the class divides, the racial divides, like the people that have access to healthcare and that don't have access to healthcare. It's like, like it's just a glaring example of the failure of America for not having a national healthcare system. And all these things just trickle down into what's going to become chaos in the world and unrest. And it's going to like, it's, you know, we're talking today on what's our date, May 28th, like, you know, the things that happened in, in, in Minneapolis just uh, two days ago are, you know, this racial unrest of about a, um, a, a black man that was killed by a police officer and held him down for nine minutes and he died on the street while four cops watched and did nothing. You know, they're burning down like the targets and the grocery stores right across from the police stations. And uh, I can't say I wouldn't do the same thing if that was where that was my community it's really kind of unfortunate. And I feel like it's all connected together because of the stress and the, and the, and the things that are happening with all of us, you know, and, and it's, you know, I'm sure your stress is the same as mine. I've talked to my friends that work at the galleries and, you know, they're all, you know, they have the same kind of like, nobody really knows what's going to happen right now. You often build your exhibitions and make your books by going back to old photos and mixing them to make a narrative. Did the situation make you look at some of your pictures differently? Uh, yes, actually, uh, th th that's a really good question because um, as you know, a, a lot of my work I'm known for like taking these photographs that are like, uh, you know, atmospheric, moody, kind of isolated, lonely images of suburbs at night, or even just, even if it's like a country road in the daytime, it still has that mood to it. And so, That's clearly, or at least it's become really clear to me. I, I've so many people have reached out to me, especially when this first started, just about talking about how, you know, they've they've known my work for years and and they they've enjoyed it, but like now, they really understand it and they feel it um, in a way that they um, hadn't quite accessed yet. And it's been kind of remarkable um, how I, I've been actually like, you know, one of the outlets for artists is Instagram and, and, and other things that are doing other, this podcast. And, you know, I've been doing a lot of, I've been trying to like be out there as much as feels appropriate. And I, I've put a whole new level of like uh, of going back into my pictures. I probably posted more in the last 75 days than I have and the whole like uh, um, time I ever had my Instagram account. And because I, I, would, I would post an image that I felt was related to something uh, that I was hearing on the news or, and just absorbing the, the feeling that was going on. And, and, and people just responded so much, like more than ever that I've ever had people respond to my work, It, just because they could relate to that. And I think that's one of the, that's one of the joys of art. Like it's actually, I mean, it sounds kind of corny, but like, But it's true. It's like, you know, you make images to speak to somebody else. Like images, images are a language. And, you know, more than ever, like they're a, a very important language that, that we universally speak. And, and I feel like, 
they're, um, the images are doing their job and they're connecting to people and they're connecting back to me. And, and I've really been touched by some of the comments and the things people have written me just because just saying that, like, even just seeing one picture, like it makes them feel like they're not alone, you know, in what they're feeling. So anyway, uh, that's a, a value of looking back through a different lens and, 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 and re recontextualizing your imagery. Your last book was called Bright Black World, and the next one will be called The End Since Advent's Warning. I don't know whether it's fortunate or not, but both titles are quite relevant to the situation. How did you come up with those titles? Yeah, well, it, it was, um, that title came from, uh, so Bright Black World is something that, um, which is basically a book of like primarily uh, landscape photographs and um, from all parts of the world. And a lot of them were in the North because I had been reading these uh, Nordic mythology uh, books like Ragnarok. And then the, the idea of Fimble Winter, like the endless apocalyptic winter um, that comes and never goes away. It's, it's I guess, a myth and a fear. Um, And so I, I made a lot of pictures that sort of like fit with that as an inspiration. And then basically I um, sort of, I, I made that, that work and, and it was also kind of like, uh, it echoed with political things that were happening going on in the world. And it just, they just sort of meshed together. And then there's a really amazing professor of art, um, uh, and, uh, Alexander Nemirov, uh, who teaches at Stanford University here. And he, um, he wrote the essay for Bright Black World And um, the first sentence of that essay was, it said, the end sends advance warning. And then he goes on to talk about um, the work. And then sometimes, and this often happens with me, is sometimes like with titles and things, like I'll get a phrase in my head or like bright black world or house hunting or whatever in a roaming. Uh, and just sometimes it just takes like three or four words and it puts a scaffolding or like a shape around what it is you're thinking and then it sort of helps you build like this this body of work it's kind of like an armature in a way like sometimes those words become that and that's where that comes from you know and like you said in the when you first started commenting it's like maybe it's fortunate maybe unfortunate but um like before this even happened like like i had uh that was like in my head as the title of my next book um and boy uh you know it fits really uh, uh unfortunately well To go back to Instagram and the web in general, do you feel that photographers are more lucky than other artists because they have a medium that fits perfectly screens? There's no question that, that for photography, we are very lucky in this situation that not only are we can we share things online and they, they can look very much like the actual thing looks, but also that we have a platform to share our, our work that's become... A, a whole language of its own, you know, like the language of visual images that's happening with so many like young people, of course, you know, but like, you know, there's things that like can be summed up with a picture. And of course, you know, there's no, uh, everybody can read a picture, usually most everybody. So yeah, so I think that photography um, and, and video artists are lucky, but in particular photography, because photography is a solo, usually a solo experience. If you can go out, like I said, I could go out in my little space shuttle and make pictures and come back to my space station and process the pictures and look at them on my computer and, and then send them off and transmit them out to the world. And so that's something that we'll, um, that photographers have that, but like just the utter, the super ease of doing that, which is really great. But at the same time, almost anyone now can take a picture and publish it. We could say that photography is a quite young art form and the art photography market is in a good shape. How do you explain that whereas there are so much pictures, art photography kept its value? That's a good question. I, I think that, um, well, I think that it probably has to do with, because of the ease of photography and that anybody can take a picture, there's of course, like you said, many, many more. There's just, like, just an endless stream of, of photographs. And even though, like, The, the cameras, you know, our phones, like they, they, they take really great pictures. I mean, they're highly tuned devices that sometimes when I'm, you know, take a, I'll just take a picture to just get a geo tag. So I know where I was when I took my, my, the photograph that I know will become, you know, um, a, a print. 
I look at the, the phone and I'm like, that is really good, you know, except, you know, it doesn't have a lot of legs because it, it can't be, it can't be made into like an object that, that's larger. Um, and uh, it can, but like, you know, of course they'll say, oh, there's billboards, you know, but like, you know, you're standing, you know, 50 feet away from the billboard when you, you see it. But anyway, um, because of how many photographs there are, I feel like people notice photographs that are, or vision, I guess, I, I, I hate to say the like vision, my vision, but because it sounds weird, but like, but the way I see things and the way other people see things is really, really unique. And, and not that I'm not saying that I'm unique. I'm saying that each phot photographic artist who really like focuses on photography, they end up, you know, coming up with their own way of doing things. And it just sort of naturally comes out just like, you know, a writer like, you know, like the difference between Raymond Carver and, you know, um, Joan Didion or something like, you know, like writers and, and things like um, just their style of writing, the way they do it, like the syntax of the photograph is really, um, um, it becomes um, very prominent and, and out there. And I think that's how, you know, that people still are interested in photography uh, from artists, even though we're saturated in photographs all the time. Before going to the end of the show, and to conclude its first part. In your landscape photography, you play a lot with lights and shadows, and there's a lot of clouds. So what is the silver lining here, if I may say? First of all, that's a very um, metaphorical question, um, and I never thought about that. For me, I, I feel like um, the silver lining with clouds and the silver lining with, with weather and whatnot is that it's sort of like it just a blue sky has a, you have a reaction to that. And then you have a reaction to a moody, cloudy sky that is almost like, um, like I love it when I, like where I grew up, I grew up in Ohio and it was a very, very flat place. And the weather always came from the West and we would just, we could look West and we could see what was coming all the time. And there would be a lot of thunderstorms in the summer and, and those kind of things. And it was really like, you can sort of like, it sort of sets your mood, you know, about what was going to happen. Like, you know, it was going to be rainy and dark and, you know, you'd have to collect all your stuff and go inside. And then, um, of course, when it was sunny and bright, we all would run around and play. But the weather is something that's always sort of like, um, it's been fascinating. I I've always like enjoyed that mood. And curiously for me, the silver lining of clouds is that like, I actually don't like photographing on blue sky days i almost never do it so that i'm happy about uh that, that's something that i love that's one of the reasons i live in the bay area is because even in the summertime even though it won't rain for like six months there'll be like there's constantly like fog that comes in almost every night and it creates like a, it just changes the mood and i like that very much now i have a couple questions from the audience the first one from lawrence lemonade I don't know whether it's a nickname or not. And her question is, how did you go professional for the first time? I guess like going professional probably means like, how did I get to show my work for the first time maybe, or, or make a living off of it? It was very slowly, um, which is how that happens, is that um, um, I had gone to graduate school and I had, um, in San Francisco, um, there were lots of like artist run galleries and like pop-up spaces and things like that. And we would, um, you know, people would put up shows and I would be in those. And then my work was seen by some curators at the Yerba Buena Art Center here. And they would do, um, they wanted to have a, a Bay Area Now exhibition, which was going to be like a triennial exhibition that happened. And, um, and, uh, and, and then how they found the artists for that is well, they would go to these small places and they wanted to see like what was really going on in the Bay Area and not just have people in it that were well-known or established, but they wanted like young artists in there that were, uh, that haven't even had a chance to really show in commercial galleries or sell things or, or, or whatnot. And my work was included in one of those exhibitions. And it was like the first seven house hunting photographs I'd taken and they were included in this exhibition. And then it wasn't just photography, it was all kinds of different art. Like Barry McGee was one of the people in the show and Chris Johansson and Margaret Kilgallen are a couple of other people that were, you know, sh first shown there. That was 20 years ago. It was 1990, longer than that. It was 1998. And basically it was, um, it was like the, kind of the first coming out of my work in, in a way that was where it was noticed. And then, you know, one of my gallerists, uh, 
uh, Stephen Wirtz Gallery. Um, they saw my work there, and then it was shown in, in a commercial context, and then it just sort of, you know, started to grow after that. And I was lucky. One thing I, I always know that I've been very, very lucky that um, is that I make the pictures I want to make because I like them. But I'm very lucky that the kind of pictures I make are also the kind of pictures that people like want to collect or want to um, live with. And that makes it a lot more doable. Um, and, and, and that's the kind of thing I would never like, you know, and, and no artist should ever like bend their work for the marketplace. You know, they should do what they want. And then, you know, there's an audience out there for everybody, you know, in some way, I think. And it's just a matter of, of finding it. But like, I think that, you know, you have to remain true to your own artwork and then something will, fi- you'll, you know, you'll find something, I think, that can, you know, help you be like what your the person asked the question was like called professional yeah thank you the second question is from noel rainey he wants to know how do you find inspiration and he takes the example of the house hunting series is it the location do you have a specific idea then find a house or does it come naturally a lot of my stuff uh, uh, originates from just wandering around. Uh, how I first found houses at night, it was something that um, I was working on this like little uh, a sequence of images that was um, in school. It was, um, it had a bunch of people found photographs in it, but I, and I had sequenced them together, but I needed a, a location for them to be in, in, in the, in the visual narrative. So there were people, but like I was trying to make a story that was visual out of these images. And then, but I needed a, a place for them to be. And so I thought, oh, I'll photograph a house at night. And then I just happened to kind of stumble upon, once I started looking, you know, I found a house that was right across the street from a, a, an auto, a car dealership um, that was very lit up and bright. And that ended up, you know, being one of my, my first houses at night. And then I liked the picture. And, and then like, you know, several months later, I was just like, I like to drive around um, and, and just look for pictures. And I, I had been new to the, I, I, I'd recently had moved to the San Francisco area. And um, I found this neighborhood that was just like an East Coast neighborhood. It was in fact built by the same people that made Levittown, New York, which is one of the first suburbs in America, which was, you know, after when you think of 1950s America, and there's all those, you know, houses that look the same, like there, it's the same exact house that they were doing but they had made some in california and but it was in a really weird place it was in a place that was up on top of the hill by the ocean and it was a very foggy place like it was one of the places that was like it it's no joke like so foggy you can't see across the street you know like a quarter of the year and it's just cold and dreary and so surreal and i remember i drove up that hill and i found those and i saw these houses and I was like, wow, this is like, it looks like the Midwest, but it's just like draped in this doom almost because of the fog. And, uh, and it all of a sudden just like it just, it hits. And sort of that's how I started doing that, those pictures by just going around. And then once you, with a lot of photography is you do something once and it, and and it works and then you, you're naturally go out because photography is such a sort of serial um, process. uh, Like, it, it, it works well when you have variations or iterations on, on a theme. And so that's how that started. And now the question I ask all my guests. Is there an artwork that for you reflects today's society or speaks to you currently? Um, that's a good question. Um, I've been looking at Dorothea Lange because uh, I, 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 that's before I, I collect photo books madly. I'm in love with them. And before this all happened, uh, there was a Dorothea Lange um, exhibition uh, that had just opened at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And that catalog came in the mail while I was, um, while, while, after we were on lockdown. And I've been thinking a lot about her work. And I had mentioned before, I was thinking about Walker Evans and I was thinking about you know, the Dust Bowl and like the, in the depression era photographs. And I would say that there's the migrant mother photograph of Dorothea Lang and the variations of that image are quite remarkable, but there are so many other images in her work that um, I'm really curious to see what would it be like, you know, if 
photographers went out and photographed their their world, the world that they that were anywhere but we are, because this is a worldwide event, and just documenting what's coming. I think that's one of the most important things. It's just to sort of like photography is, you know, as you, of course, you know, it's one of the best documentary methods. And of course, there's Walker Evans would say there's no such thing as documentary, only documentary style. But let's just put those things down and just say photographs record the world in a way. And of course we can manipulate them, but you know, if you want them to be, they can be very accurate and real. And I think that an accurate, real sort of like approach to making images right now is, uh, is, you know, in order. It could be something that would just be, I mean, I think it's what everybody should do. It would be amazing to have a collection of like, what's really going on everywhere that's realistic and not manipulated. And um, of course there's artistic, you know, touches, but like, uh, you know, there's just something about photography that's so wonderful about it. It's, it's just simplicity and capturing what's in front of us. Well, Todd, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. We wish you all the best. And I wish you guys the best too. I have a particular uh, affection for f the French. So, Thanks for asking me. And I hope that everything goes well for you. And I hope to be over there in November. We'll see how it goes. And it will be a pleasure to see you, as always. Bye, Todd. Okay, bye-bye. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of Art Goes On. If you like what you heard, feel free to follow and share the show on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on YouTube. Leave a rating or review to help people find the show. Thanks again.